Welcome, everybody, to JW Broadcasting. My co-host is Brother Isaac Murray, and his given name is Isaac, but we all call him Saki. Well, you don't have to dissect it. If you could just tell me why this is supposed to be funny. I'm so glad to see you, Saki, because we've got a lot of work today. Well, my name's not Saki, but I gotta agree with Mr. Explain. We got some work to do. And maybe we need to start some new traditions, mix things up a little bit. Uh, I don't know, how about some poetry? Uh, roses are red, my balls are blue. This intro's gonna suck. Next time, a haiku. That's the best I got. I always say this is the worst intro ever. Like, but unironically, I think this one might be the worst intro ever. We're watching the JW broadcast from April. We're on the intro. Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today we are looking at the April 2024 JW Broadcasting episode. Uh, quickly before we get into it, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, literally it keeps the channel alive. I know it only takes one second so it might not seem like a big deal but it's really what keeps JW Thoughts uh, up and running and the lights on so I very much appreciate it. Now we did look at one little snippet from Mr. Explain uh, talking about how the governments will never beat him and his pals. Uh, we'll explore a little bit of the build up to that and then maybe dissect this a little bit more as well as consider what else was said during this broadcasting episode. So with that quick intro let's Jump right into it. You have quite an interesting background in the truth. Why don't you tell us something about it? My grandfather and great-grandfather on my mother's side came into the truth in the early 1920s. When I was about 10 years old, I read the book, What Has Religion Done for Mankind? And I was convinced that my mother had the truth. My two brothers and three sisters also embraced the truth at an early age. Now a little PSA from Uncle Wally here. Watchtower uses rhetorical tricks in order to solidify in the minds of their followers ideas that on any given Tuesday would seem ridiculous or nonsensical. So a lot of times people are critical of the way I make fun of Watchtower. Oh, well, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't going to hear that. And okay, maybe that's, that's a fair point. But the reason I do that is because we need to get out of this mindset of using Watchtower's language. It's not the truth. It is some random guys in New York cherry-picking random passages from an ancient book that we don't know who wrote or when it was written. That is much more accurate than just calling it the truth. And by using their language, I feel like we adopt some of those mental patterns. So if you're watching this and you find yourself struggling with the truth or, or any of the myriad of watchtower expressions that we grew up with or we just became part of our common vernacular, replace it with a fart sound. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but just replace it with something silly. Because when you start doing that, you, you break free from that watchtower mindset and you see things for what they actually are. And my God, they really loaded the front of this interview. Now, what he goes on to say isn't all that interesting, but it is something that I do find talking to ex-witnesses. Uh, oftentimes they struggle with or catch themselves saying, so uh, just give it a whirl, give it a try, and uh, have a bit of a laugh at some of those things. And you'll be amazed at how fast you will lose all of the watchtower lingo. Now notice this. So my word, my word that goes out of my mouth will be. It will not return to me without results, but it will certainly accomplish whatever is my delight. The Word of God is the statement of His purpose. Now, it can be delivered orally or in writing. We call the Bible 
God's written word, and rightly so. But long before writing was invented, Jehovah expressed his purpose in words. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Are you okay? No. Thank you for asking. I, on occasion, have been prone to a little bit of conspiratorial thinking, uh, maybe questioning whether or not David Explain here truly believes in the doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses or if he is an evil mastermind that really knows it's all a lot of hogwash. And then that sort of conspiratory went... Conspiratory? Wow, that wasn't even close. Anyway, that absolutely went in the waste bin because... Uh, how do you say a sentence like this? Not only how do you say it, like I don't script my videos, so I say some dumb stuff, but this man wrote this out, revised his little script, no doubt rehearsed it, then comes out here, listens to it, has it edited, and still puts it out. <laughs> well, God communicates in many different ways. Oh, really, David, how? Well, most of the time it's through his written word, but sometimes he spoke. Oh, really? Well, how does he speak? How do you know he speaks? Well, through his written word. <laughs> like, what a dummy. <laughs> I don't I don't get it. So anyone that thinks that he might be a, a mastermind here, or, or I guess this could go one of two ways, to say something so stupid, like, oh, well, God sometimes speaks and doesn't use the written word. Well, how do you know that? Well, it says it in this book. <laughs> Maybe he's testing the waters to see just how far he can go, just how mentally deluded Jehovah's Witnesses actually are. And if people don't write in letters, what did you mean by that? That didn't make any sense. Maybe it's just like, well, I guess I can just say whatever, and people will just eat it up as the word of God. Anyway, I found that absolutely hysterical. The point of this whole talk, to be more on point, is uh, using the scripture uh, talking about whatever Jehovah says will absolutely come true. Now, he goes and gives some biblical examples, which we're just going to press forward and move right along past those. Uh, but then he does mention something about governments. Now, I did play this uh, from a clip in my last video, but I did have a few more things that I wanted to say about it. So let's just give that a look-see. How do you think Pilate felt? He must have been a nervous wreck. As we said, he and Sejanus had been very close. And now, a year and a half after Sejanus was executed, what do you suppose Pilate was thinking when the Jewish rulers cried out, If you release Jesus, you are no friend of Caesar. Some scholars believe that this was a factor in Pilate's decision to order Jesus' execution to protect his own job. Did he protect it? No. Pilate wasn't immediately struck by lightning. But less than four years after he sentenced Jesus to death, he got into big trouble and was recalled to Rome. With no powerful friend to defend him, Pilate was removed as Roman governor. What happened next isn't clear. Some say Pilate committed suicide. Others say he was banished. Whatever happened, it wasn't good. Now, I wanted to include just a little bit of, uh, I guess, the preamble to this declaration of weird, wimpy warnings that they're going to give to modern-day governments, just so we kind of understand what the tone that he's trying to set. These people in the past have been resisting Jehovah's organization or Jehovah's people or Jehovah's will, and they messed around and they definitely found out. Now... They don't, or he doesn't, address this directly, but the timing would be impeccable if he's at least not tacitly referring to what happened in the Norwegian case. If you missed it, go look. I think I have a whole playlist uh, on the channel of about like eight, nine, maybe even ten videos uh, sort of breaking down everything that's been happening uh, over in Norway over the course of the last like year and a half, two years almost now. But anyway, so let's jump ahead and uh, see what this little declaration of warnings is. Even in countries where there's a measure of religious freedom, fighters against God have tried to prevent us from carrying out our commission. 
You need a permit to go from house to house. You can't offer magazines on the street. You people are a dangerous sect. They've even enacted laws directed at stopping our work. Unless they change their ways, those lawmakers are going to be in big trouble. You're in big trouble, mister. Those lawmakers are going to be in big trouble. You're in big trouble, mister. This guy has positioned himself to be this wise, unquestionable leader of millions of people all around the earth. As we move through the last days and the great tribulation, people are to not even question any decision he makes, have absolute trust. And in order to build confidence in that trust, what does he say? You're in big, big trouble, mister. Like, what? He sounds like a, a school child. Like an actual two-year-old, like wagging his finger at governments. Doesn't he understand who he's dealing with? With trained professionals? He's, these guys are about to go to the Supreme Court. And the best he's got is, you better change or you're in big, big trouble. I, I, I don't think he has any self-awareness about the situation. It, it's like the uh, line from Art of War by Sun Tzu. If you... Know yourself and you know your enemy, you need not fear in a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not your enemy, for every victory you will suffer defeat. But if you neither know yourself nor your enemy, you will lose every battle. You'll succumb at every battle. And that's what's happening. He doesn't know himself. He doesn't know the enemy. And he looks like an absolute idiot. I find this so hilarious. That great work will be accomplished with their support or in spite of them. Well, as we mentioned, fighters against God sometimes seem to get away with their acts of rebellion. But they're on a slippery slope. So, when you hear about powerful opposers who seem to be untouchable, remember what we've discussed. These men may seem to prosper for a while, but since they're fighting against God, they're more to be pitied than to be feared. They're on the wrong side. They are fighting a losing battle. Thank you, Brother Splain, for your encouraging discussion. Fighters against God always lose. All jokes aside, what do I actually think is going on here? I think this is a clandestine maneuver to try and appear like they are the ones that gained victory. So I think their thought process was, hey, we're going to make some subtle changes to our uh, disfellowshipping policies, specifically as it pertains to minors. Now, hopefully they don't get away with it because, as I said in a previous video, the problem still exists that they don't allow people, especially children, to exercise religious freedom. So as long as they still have that clause in there about apostates or, you know, anyone that disagrees with the governing body, then they still don't have uh, the freedom to choose whatever religion they want. They'll still baptize them when they're very young. All of the problems still are 100% intact with that in, 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 in mind. So they can try and make these minor adjustments, and maybe in their mind or with their legal counsel, they feel like they've changed it enough. And then they come out, you know, beating their chest and hitting their sword against their shield and, you know, hooting and hollering, acting all proud because... They're going to bank on the fact that most witnesses won't even remember some of those subtle changes that they that they made. They're going to forget that and just be happy that they have the beards and the pants and all that good to go. And they're going to sort of ignore this core issue about why they're making all these changes. Uh, it's, it's like, uh, what's the old Roman tactic? Give them the bread in the circus. If you keep people fed and distracted, then they'll, you know, they won't rebel against you no matter what their position might be. So 
I think that's what's going on here. I think this is a clandestine maneuver to come out with all of the bravado. That way, if the Supreme Court does rule in their favor, they can say, look, huh, we told you all along, no one can stop us, thus ingratiating themselves into the minds and hearts of their followers, turning them even more robotic in their thinking, like, oh, wow, well, we must be getting close to the end. Oh, everything these guys says, absolutely. Look, it's coming true. He, he's a modern-day prophet by, by George. So I think that's what's actually going on here, but speculating and having a bit of fun with it is also a lot of fun. But hey, comment down below. Let me know what you guys think is, is really going on with all of this, because he sounds like a total moron, given the context of everything that we know about what's been going on in, in Europe. Trusting Jehovah when faced with one problem after another is not easy but it can refine us. Please listen as Sister Sigrid de Toffoli explains how she learned this lesson. In 1946, we found out my father was alive, my sister was alive. We were very privileged to be united as a family. And at that time, my father was near Berlin. And so we started all over again. My father, he found the book, The Harp of God, and started to study the Bible with my sister and with myself. And little by little, he started a congregation at our house. For anyone interested, I did do a short series of, I think it's just like six or seven videos, uh, talking about this very book, The Harp of God, where I show some of the things that are really inconsistent that any Jehovah's Witness living today would really be shocked by. Things from Zionism to 1914, 1925, the preaching work having already been completed back in the 20s. Things get real wild uh, when it comes to that book. So if you're interested, I know probably most of you uh, haven't even seen those videos because they didn't get a whole lot of views. But uh, heck, I'll put a link down in the description below. And here's what the thumbnails look like. So check them out. I was actually really proud of those videos. So yeah, anyway, now that I'm done plugging myself, that sounds terrible. They ask you how you are. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. But you just can't get into it. The official ban on the witnesses in the eastern zone of Germany came 1950, but months before, we were already being observed. My father got literature for the congregation, and many times he would send me on a bicycle through the forest with the literature. So it's interesting, when you're in that situation, you might go to prison. You just don't worry about it. You trust in Jehovah. And you just go ahead. And that's what our family did. This message is coming through very loud and clear. Simple. You just don't worry about it. You don't ask questions. You just do it. You bunch of softies nowadays asking questions with your god dang iPhones and your Google searches. You get off that stupid internet and just shut up, do what you're told, you might go to prison, but that's okay too. You just don't think about it, you do it. And then I was privileged to attend the 29th class of Gilead. And my assignment was Brazil. And it was like paradise. And there, I met my husband, who was my circuit overseer. Life is the most important thing there is because no matter how much you have, you can't prolong your life. I probably sound like an old fogey now, just saying the same thing, telling the same stories over and over again, or repeating the same sentiments, but it absolutely grinds my gears every single time I hear them use someone that has dedicated their entire life, made so many sacrifices for this organization, only to get whipped around and changing times and changing generations and changing doctrines for nothing. And she acknowledges that, you know, 
It's not about money. It's not about what you have. Because life is the only thing that you truly have. And that's precious. Yeah, it is. And yet you had this precious long life that was taken away from you because you were unfortunate enough to believe the lies of one person and it eventually became a sunk cost fallacy of, well, I've already put so much time. She probably said that in her 30s and her 50s. Now she's in her 80s. Not, I, maybe she's in her 90s now, no doubt. And still, waiting for absolutely bupkis. Waiting around for someone to make good on a promise that will absolutely never come true. Breaks my heart every single time. And hopefully, when younger Jehovah's Witnesses are forced to watch this broadcast, they can look at this person's life and say, what if that was me? In 60, 70 years. Is that going to happen to me? Where you just keep believing the lies of these idiots. And before you know it, your entire life is gone. The following dramatization is based on the real life experiences of some of our brothers. It's been three days since the bomb started to fall. When the fighting got closer, we hid. But I'm not sure how much longer we can stay here. Some in the congregation plan to leave the country. Mother says we'll try too when the shelling calms down, but it feels like it may never stop. Jehovah, can you still see us? Luda, you can finish this. We have a little more. Always writing like your father. Thank you, Grandma. So we just got done listening to a real-life example that included dramatizations. Now, for this next one, he goes and specifically mentions that this one is a dramatization, but it's based off of the experiences that a lot of people have gone through. So I just out of curiosity typed in Ukraine in the search bar of JW.org and I found a story called My Journey to Safety and it almost mirrors this exact dramatization that they're about to tell. And my question is, why in one example can you name the person, can you show them, all of that good stuff? And you have another example that you're going to tell that you've already told on your website before, but now you want to make sure that it's fake. If anyone in the comments is smarter than me and can figure out why they would do this, I'd be curious to know what sort of uh, tinfoil hat conspiracies you've cooked up. Because I can't really think of why they would do this. They already show the person's face and their family and tell the story, and they basically tell the story, but go out of their way to say it's not real. And I don't really get it. So here is uh, how the article starts on JW.org. Uh, June 23rd, 2022, My Journey to Safety, a Ukrainian story of survival as told by Anastasia Kazyanova. On the morning of February 24th, 2022, I woke up because of loud noises. At first, I thought it was thunder because it was raining outside. But it actually, what I heard, were bombs falling. I realized that I had to leave my house, which was in the center of Mariupol. The next day, I went to my grandmother Irina's house on the outskirts of the city. Later, my mother Katerina joined my grandmother, cousin, and me. Grandma's house provided safety for a while, but we had to sleep in the basement for, for several days. So we have this young girl who's staying with her grandma and her mother, and they're in a basement, bombs falling. I think you can see where this is going, but let's get back to the video and we'll see how this trend continues. I know you're worried about our brothers and sisters. Do you remember the day's text? No weapon formed against you will have any success. That's right. When we were under ban, Satan did everything to break our faith. For decades, 
but he couldn't stop us preaching. You know why? No. Nothing can take Jehovah's law away from his people. They tried, but we just drew closer to him. Jehovah cared for us then, and he still does. Even if we lose our lives, that weapon will have no success because of the resurrection. I cannot stand this type of thinking because a proposition is either true or false. So the proposition, Jehovah will protect us. If he protects you, you make it out alive. If he doesn't protect you, then y you die. Okay, there's a billion other factors that could be at play here. But just in the context of this, you cannot just have it both ways. Well, whether we live or whether we die, Jehovah still protected us. And I'm not terribly interested in a appeal to a unquantifiable, undemonstrable, supernatural solution, especially one that was cooked up in the brains of someone that lived in a primitive society, that, that didn't understand electricity, that didn't understand the electromagnetic spectrum, that didn't have penicillin. Hell, they didn't even, forget the cillin, they didn't even have the pen part of it. It's insane to me that you would use that as the foundation for life and death decision making. It's not a healthy way to live your life, and this sort of trickles down when you're a Jehovah's Witness to almost every aspect of your life where you are able to trick yourself and fool yourself into thinking all matter of nonsense. You know, once you believe that one plus one can equal five million, th things get really goofy in your head. And that is what happens with Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at the New Light Doctrine and how they just swallow up everything. Well, we were right back then, and we're also right now. No, you were either right or wrong then. You're either right or wrong now. That is that is how this thing works. So whenever they put this in the old wheelbarrow and, and wheel it out to Witnesses so they can just eat up this slop, it really irks me. I'm upset. Luda. It's time. We have to go now. It took forever to get to the station. One by one, trains left the city. There were so many people, so much fear. Many of the brothers were arrested because they would not fight, but a few were with us. The soldier will need to see your IDs. Let's make a line. Hours felt like days. I didn't know if we would get on. There's no more room! You. From you back. To the shelter. Now. Don't worry, we can try again tomorrow. This way, please. Luda, Jehovah will care for us. This is just a delay, not a defeat. Come, please. I'll have to go check on the others but I'll text you the moment we know more. Once, a missile fell in our vegetable garden while we were hiding in the basement. The explosion was deafening. I prayed earnestly to Jehovah after a week. We knew that it was no longer safe to stay in Grandma's house, so we decided to go back to the center of the city to find a way to evacuate. I begged Jehovah to keep us safe, 
and get us out of there. It was the morning of March 4th. There were no trains available from Mariupol because the city was under siege. So we took shelter in the city's theater with hundreds of others for the next 10 days. It was so crowded that we had to sleep on the floor. Conditions were unsanitary. It was very difficult to get food and hot water. We had to stand in line for hours. So we have, again, this mirroring of this story where, okay, now we're trying to get out and we had to stand in line or trying to get a train. And then, sorry, no trains available, have to go wait at this station and wait and hope and pray on these horrible, unsanitary conditions. Why are they not just giving the story that they've already told on JW.org? Why? I, I just really don't understand it. But shout outs to this elder, classic elder mentality Dude has probably no idea what's going on, but hey, he, he's taking charge. He might be a total bozo, uh, but hey, fake it till you make it, brother. So I, I just got such a giggle from this because it is the classic elder mentality of it doesn't matter if you know what you're talking about. You got to just take the lead and figure it out. And Oh, OK, well, hey, they want to see our passports. Let's all form a neat, tidy line. Oh, OK, well, I got to go check on the others. So it's just their way of always thinking that they're un in control or you know part of this greater plan or purpose when they're just another person standing with the other thousands of people in line trying to get out of the city and they have no extra special information but it's crazy how people still will look up to them and how they portray them in this way because it, hey, it's actually pretty accurate Sophia. Luna. Anna. we're here we're over here i'm sorry it took so long did you hear about the trains don't worry, there is good news. We couldn't leave, but brothers and sisters in a safe part of the city opened their homes to us. I learned that a war can't stop Jehovah. He'll always find a way to care for his people. Nothing can take Jehovah's love away. And the classic ending to every Watchtower video where people are in trouble. You get crickets from the organization, you get crickets from Jehovah, but thankfully you have people that are part of your community that are willing to help you out whenever everything goes wrong. So basically, just like every other Christian organ, I mean, that is a basic Christian principle, right, of being charitable and helping those that are in your faith and in your community. The thing with other Christians, though, is they also help people outside of their community, where Jehovah's Witnesses only help those because it is a very insular group. Anyway, with all of that being said, let's keep moving on. The expression used in our day's text, the word used is overreached. And what comes to mind when we hear someone that has been overreached? I'm going to be completely honest. I am not a huge fan of listening to old Harold Cockring's uh, talks. They're pretty boring, and he's not a very engaging speaker. Uh, the whole idea of his talk is just to try and make you completely terrified that every door and cabinet you open, every street and alley you go down, Satan's always there watching. So intense is this pressure from Satan that you'll even feel it inside the congregation. Uh, listen to what he has to say. There was a brother serving as an elder, but he had seen active combat in the army. He had been through terrible things. But when he faced criticism, thoughtless remarks, and was hurt by his fellow work workers in the congregation, what did he say about those tests within the congregation? He says... It's the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. So what can the devil use? Our own brothers can say or do things sometimes, and the devil will play on that and amplify that and cause one to stop, stop serving Jehovah. Yes, this dude is actually comparing someone that has served in active military during war, one of the most traumatic experiences any human being can go through, with 
being a Jehovah's Witness inside a congregation and having a disagreement with someone. Because Satan will use even the own, your own congregation against you. This level of fear-mongering from this talk is, is really crazy and silly because we just get through hearing about how the congregation is a safe haven, and yet it can be worse than seeing the gore and going through the trauma of war. It's a strange talk, to say the least, but it's coming from a very strange man, at least from appearances sake, so anyway, let's move right along. Well, one thing that this JW Broadcasting has taught me is that Jehovah does save us. He does protect us, because I can definitively say there is nothing more interesting in this broadcast. The music video, thank goodness, it's completely unremarkable, so we won't even look at it. And then they have their series Iron Sharpens Iron, which is just a bunch of obvious tips for improving and finding people to talk to when you want to be a preacher. So that's about it. Thank you so much for joining me. If you're still around, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Stay safe, be kind, and show yourself the same kindness that you show to others. And uh, hey, we made it through another JW broadcast, so have a good ass day now.